Welcome into the Art Gibbs Sports Business Podcast. This is episode five. In this episode, we're going to be talking about Bernie Ecclestone and the modernization of Formula One, part one. To borrow from the great Teddy Roosevelt, quote, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly. His Hugh Bullet watch was taken from him. Already accomplished and well-known at this point, he was jumped, beaten, and after the ordeal, he sent a photo of his bruised face to Hugh Blow and said, quote, use it in an advertisement. A look what someone will do for a Hugh Blow. Other than that, no big deal. Schutzpa. Shameless audacity, impudence. His mother-in-law was kidnapped in Brazil. The kidnappers wanted 124 million euro. He said, quote, I wanted to pay, not the 124 million because I'm a dealer, but I wanted to go over there with a bag of cash and meet them. What's on the battlefield and in the arena stays in the arena. In dealing with Donald Trump, the deal fell through and he remarked, we should tell him he forgot to ask for Trump on the toilet paper. Later discussing this, he said, He wanted to be completely in charge. He wanted Trump everywhere, which is right. He's quite right. He was doing nothing wrong. Bernie Ecclestone is perhaps one of the better, tougher negotiators of the past half century. Standing a diminutive 5-3, he has battled and brokered some of the biggest and best deals we've ever seen. But perhaps his most awe-inspiring tale is that of bringing unity to the sport of Formula One negotiating the Concord Agreement and propelling Formula One into a new age and making himself a billionaire several times over in the process. This is the story of Bernie Ecclestone and the drive to make Formula One into the modern juggernaut of today. Ecclestone was born in 1930 into a middle-class household. His father was a fisherman. His mother tended the home. The town was St. Peter South Elmham a small village of about 40 people in the majestic countryside of north, northeast of London. Beyond its beauty, it's mostly known for, well, being Bernie Ecclestone's birthplace. After attending primary school there, his father moved to southeast London. Shortly thereafter, as World War II began to pick up in earnest, and families were encouraged to relocate to the countryside, as these urban areas were potential targets, Ecclestone stayed in the city with his family. His family opted to stay through World War II, opting not to evacuate to the countryside. This was potentially for the best, as it was during this time that Ecclestone's penchant for dealing and dealing with people was first brought to the surface. Being around the GIs at the time, Ecclestone would bargain with them. He'd send messages to their girlfriends while they were unable to leave base, and in return he'd get a pack of chewing gum. They'd stick it through the fence to him. In the future, he'd bargain for a lot more. After World War II, Bernie continued on in the dealing trading vein. He got a job at a gas station at his father's behest, but he spent a large portion of his time looking through newspapers for motorcycle parts and then for motorcycles themselves that he could buy and sell and make a profit on. Shortly thereafter, this trade that he was doing on the side grew into a bigger moneymaker than his job at the gas station. And Bernie looked to make it official with a job in the field of trading. He began working for Les Croker, the owner of the nearby Harcourt Motorcycles, where he immediately became a successful salesman, spiffing up the showroom and immediately began growing sales from there. He was a success there by any measure. Bernie, always seeking more, went to the nearby Compton and Fuller dealership, looking to become a partner there. He was initially rebuffed by Compton and Fuller. Even with this successful track record at Les Coker, they didn't want to make him a partner outright. So, Bernie came up with a solution. He proposed to them that he rent a portion of the dealership, the motorcycle portion, and in return he'd give Compton and Fuller a percentage of the profits. They agreed, and voila, Ecclestone was a partner of sorts. It wasn't long, with his pristine showroom and tremendous salesmanship, before the motorcycle sales began to skyrocket, well past the car sales component of the business. 
1945, Ecclestone purchased Fuller's share in the business and it became known as Compton and Ecclestone, becoming a full-blown dealership, replete with scrolling signage across the front, quote, Compton and Ecclestone LTD, and display windows along the bottom floor so passersby could window shop from the sidewalks. It was around this time that Ecclestone convinced his partner to look into racing, ecstasy to boost business. Although Ecclestone himself clearly had a love for racing, he competed here and there mostly on the nearby famed Brand Hatch Raceway. In 1945, he competed in the 500cc Formula 3 series, and he actually started in two Formula 1 races. He didn't finish any, but tried, and at the highest level of open wheeled racing in the world, that's pretty good. Later on, in 1958, he tried to qualify a car from Monaco, although he later stated that this was not a serious attempt. Racing well at this high level, but mostly on love of the sport, and not on any talent that would take him to a sustained world-class level. It was valiant work, but it wouldn't be on the track where he would make his mark in racing. After suffering through several accidents in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and with his penchant for dealing, he took a step away from the racing world to seek success elsewhere, namely the business world. He took nearly a 10-year hiatus away from racing, focusing his skills instead on real estate, car auctions, and loan financing, investments which ultimately turned out to be very lucrative for him. Then, in 1957, with a few more ruples in his pocket, and a desire to win, he once again set his sights on the racing world. This time, as manager of the Stuart Lewis Evans Racing Team, he purchased two used chassis from the defunct Canant F1 team for Stuart to drive on. In the Monaco Grand Prix of that year, driving the Canant chassis, Stuart finished in fourth place overall behind the far superior Maserati and Van Wall chassis. The following year, after both he and Ecclestone, who was his manager at the time, moved to Von Wall, Stuart Lewis Evans was killed, tragically, on the final lap of the Monaco Grand Prix. His engine seized up, smashing him into the wall at high speed. His car caught fire with him in it, and six days later, he died from his injuries. After Stuart Lewis Evans racing, Ecclestone remained active in the sport as a manager, becoming close with Joachim Rint when Rint moved to the Lotus Formula 2 team. Ecclestone followed as his manager and eventually became a partial owner of the team. Rint was a friend as well as a business associate, and unfortunately, he too tragically died. It was at Monza in a practice run. Crashing into the poorly constructed barriers at speed, Rint was on his way to winning the world championship, a championship that he was awarded posthumously. It was heartbreak again for Bernie. Auto racing in general was extremely dangerous in these days, something Ecclestone would actually help change in Formula One in the future. Enter Bromham and Formula One. After the 1970 season, Ecclestone was approached by the then-current owner of the Bromham Formula One team, Ron Taranak. Although Taranak was only looking for a partial partner, Ecclestone made him an offer for €100,000 for the whole team. Taranak accepted. In running the Bromham team, Ecclestone abandoned the successful consumer car business, even though it was very financially successful for Bromham. And ironically, even though Bernie himself had had success in consumer motor sales. He believed for a Formula One team to be successful at the highest level, there needed to be a sole focus on racing within the team and management. The Bromham team experienced slightly more success in the 73 and 74 seasons with some chassis alterations. But characteristic to Ecclestone, he was seeking more and signed a new engine supplier deal with Alfa Romeo. As Ecclestone was building his personal Formula One team, he was also working for and on the sport as a whole. Ecclestone didn't just believe he might have a better way to run his own Formula One team, but he also felt the sport as a whole could use improving. In 1974, Ecclestone formed the Formula One Constructors Association, known as FOCA. This association was, with several of the team principals, done in an effort to work together 
on commercialization efforts in the sport. FOCA generally consisted of the privately held teams that were not supported by manufacturers, manufacturers like Ferrari, Alfa Romeo, etc. This would become an important distinction in years to come, this division between the privately held teams and these better funded manufacturer-backed teams. Throughout the next few years, Ecclestone kept pushing for performance within Bromham team, ending the Alfa Romeo era after a few years to move back to the Cosworth engines, a move that those on the team lauded. Ecclestone also worked hard to sign talented drivers like Nicky Lauda and Nelson Piquet. In 1978, Ecclestone became the chief executive of the Formula One Constructors Association, or FOCA. And in that same year, Jean-Marie Balleste became the head of FISA, the governing body of Formula One, Federation Internationale de l'Automobile. Throughout the next few years, tension built between FISA and Balleste and FOCA and Ecclestone. The grievances generally were as follows. Perceived favoritism to the old guard, Ferrari, Renault, etc., these teams in in manufacturers, there was a perceived favoritism to them by Balliste and FISA in rulings on crashes and fines levied in conjunction with those rulings, etc. Additionally, there were quick rule changes by FISA that were done with less than a two-year lead time, which was a, the original stated rule, making it difficult for teams to change in time. The ostentatious spending habits by Balliste staying in presidential suites when traveling, etc., all on FISA's tab, did not help matters either. Ecclestone wanted to see some power come back to the teams themselves. To assist him in these negotiations with Balliste, or maybe a better way to put it, was to assist him in getting to the negotiating table with Balliste, Ecclestone brought in a former racer and former team owner and attorney, Max Mosley. Mosley a Brit whose parents were interned under Regulation 18B, Britain's internment regulation during World War II, an action that separated young Mosley and his siblings from their parents for several years. Even after his parents were freed, Max and his siblings were refused entry to most schools as when they were children due to, quote, wildness and their parents' reputations. Max and his siblings were homeschooled, then moved around the country, and then moved around Europe. Mosley went to school in Germany and London, and then finally studied law at Gray's Inn in England. Mosley was a racer himself and subsequently headed up the March Engineering Formula One team till 1977, when he sold that team. So there they were, and the two began leading what would be an ongoing, multi-years-long quest for negotiating with FISA and Jean-Marie Balliste. In 1981, still as a team owner, and after three years of angst between the parties, Foca with Ecclestone and Mosley and Faiza with Jean-Marie, the Foca boys made a last-ditch effort to get everyone to the negotiating table. They decided to organize, host, and hold their own race. The venue would be at the Kailami Circuit in February of 1981. Legend has it that Colin Chapman, one of the members of Foca, and a few other individuals involved were skiing in Austria in the winter of late 1980. On the wall of the restaurant that they were dining in, they saw a painting on the wall, which had several people, and they were all painting a single cow different colors. They asked the waitress what it meant, and she said that it represented a town that was so poor they only had one cow, so each day they would paint it different colors and display it in an area that the enemy could see making it look as if they were a town of plenty, even though they were a town of one. The FOCA teams were generally in a tough spot. They did not have tires lined up for their upcoming season, and budgets were running thin, with some members even mortgaging their own homes just to keep the teams going. Putting on a race would be their version of showing strength to the enemy. They would show FISA they didn't need them to run a race, and hopefully that would scare them just enough to get to the negotiating table. The Kailami circuit was a good pick for a venue, as this circuit itself had just signed a new sponsorship agreement and needed to have a race the following year. So even as Balliste condemned the race as unsanctioned and threatened the venue by saying they would pull future Formula One races, 
the circuit needed the race to take place, and FOCA needed the race to take place to show that they had the wherewithal to put on a race themselves. Challenging the almighty power of the FIA and threatening to undermine the FIA's power and the sport as a whole, if these races continued on without the likes of Ferrari, Alfa Romeo, and Renault. As the Old Guard team saw this race take place successfully without them, with just the FOCA teams, they began to worry about the real prospect of the sport being fractured and or of themselves being left behind. Consequently, they began to put pressure on Balliste to work something out with FOCA. The tactic had worked, and it was in this climate that Ecclestone called a meeting of all interested parties. The place for the meeting would be the FIA offices in France, the home of Jean-Marie Balliste. Balliste was a former member of the French SS, or perhaps an undercover agent of the French resistance. No one is really sure. But either way, he was a Legion of Honor winner in 1968, the French's highest military honor, and not one to be pushed over. The offices were located on the Place de la Concorde in Paris, France, the iconic plaza at the center of French history nestled among Museum Row, right along the winding River Seine. The group entered the 18th century building through heavy steel gates and into what would be 13 hours of straight negotiations. At the end of the marathon negotiations, an agreement was reached. The agreement would be called the Concord Agreement, and the strict terms would be kept secret. But we do know the main pillars, and the main pillars of the agreement were as follows. They were the right and obligation for each team that signed the contract to compete in every F1 race on the calendar to help create a consistent quality TV product and an agreement to the suitability of the rules so teams were not being ragdolled around by the governing body. Additionally, and perhaps most interestingly, FOCA leased the rights of television distribution, i.e. FOCA would pay FISA and the FIA for the television rights for all of Formula One. And remember, this is the new Formula One where all teams were allowed to and had to compete in each race. Putting Ecclestone, who was the head of FOCA, effectively in ownership and control of the commercial and television rights for all of Formula One. This would be the first of many such Concord agreements, and it was signed January 19, 1981. This would be only the beginning to Ecclestone and his work in Formula One. And when it was all said and done, he'd walk away with a heck of a lot more than the chewing gum he did as a child. That concludes part one. And we will continue with a part two and three later on in the Sports Business Podcast library. Uh, But we wanted to go ahead and get this one out. This is the part one on Ecclestone and all that he's done in Formula One. And again, please tell your friends about this podcast. Like, subscribe if there's someone you want to see interviewed. We'd love to hear your suggestions on that. That would be fantastic. And additionally, um, I'll just make a note here. Uh, These podcasts are kind of more story time, and they talk about uh, different things, uh, different anecdotes and sports and, and business. And that's Uh, what we want to kind of keep it at here on the podcast. Uh, But we do have some uh, videos on YouTube, and those are going to be more technical videos on, uh, you know, bond math and some some more complex financial products and things like that. Um, And we have kind of almost a separate community there in some ways that has been enjoying those videos, and we'd like to continue those on as well. And so... If that sounds like it would be something of interest to you, they're just little short educational videos um, on certain types of financial products and things like that. You can head over there and look at those. Uh, We'd appreciate that as well. Again, that's just uh, Art Gibbs. That's uh, the YouTube uh, channel there. Um, Anyway, so thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time. We're kind of in uh, kind of in full force here, producing uh, producing podcasts and videos and, and all of that kind of stuff. And um, thanks so much. Take care.